All right, guys, welcome to another episode in the MD journey. Today, I'm super excited because we are doing one of our first interviews here on the channel and on the podcast. And I couldn't think of anyone better to begin that process with than one of my good friends, Tommy Martin. And he is an absolute rock star at all the different aspects of his life. He's going to give you examples of why that's true. But more importantly, he's going to show you how you can become the rock star in your own life. So stay tuned. Enjoy the conversation. If you're coming from Tommy's channel and you're new to ours, consider subscribing and liking this video. And if you're unfamiliar with Tommy, then he will let you know where he thinks is best for you to follow him and learn more about him. And I will put all of that information in the description as well as the show notes for the podcast. But hopefully you guys enjoy. We'll talk to you soon. All right, guys, welcome to another episode in the TMJ show and the MD journey. Today, I'm super excited because, you know, we wanted to get some guests on that could go ahead and speak to the mission that we do here at TMJ and the MD journey, which is to help people on their medical journey, motivate them encourage them. And I was thinking of people that we can go ahead and get on this channel, get on the podcast. The first person that came to my mind was one of my friends, Tommy, um, huge influencer on Instagram. Um, he is an amazing guy from Missouri. Interesting. Also did his medical school in the Caribbeans. That's where um, he w met his now wife, um, and they together went ahead and got couples matched to the University of Arkansas, where both of them are doing their internal medicine and pediatric um, residency. He's currently finishing up his second year. Um, but in addition to all the medicine stuff, again, the reason I wanted him on is just he is amazing at having balance. So he's a freakish athlete. That's definitely something we'll talk about. <laughs> Um, and he's just, he's just a well-rounded guy. So Tommy, welcome to the TMJ show, dude. Thank you so much for being a part of it. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you for having me. It's definitely an honor and I love the opportunity to speak to medical students and hopefully, you know, future doctors and encourage them along their journey. Yeah. So, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I kind of want to start tradition because you'll be one of the first guests that we have, um, here on the channel. And so, you know, there, there's obviously the, the, the part of being able to share something about yourself that tell me about yourself that we kind of can all figure out through Instagram, but what's something that people don't know about you? Mm. You know, that's a tough one. I'm a very open person, you know, like I think I have most of my life on either Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, <laughs> on some social media platforms. So that's a hard one. Uh, so something that people may, I mean, people that know me really well would know this, and this is just something weird and strange. Um, but I used to be addicted to ranch dressing. Uh, so I, I, <laughs> I would eat about three bottles a week of ranch dressing and Jeez. I would eat it literally on everything from hot dogs, pizza, chili, eggs, biscuits, like anything in the world that you could imagine I'd eat it on. And I quit. Oh, I went through, you know, the seven step or 10 step program, whatever it is, <laughs> and, uh, got over my addiction. I think when I was 21 and I haven't had ranch dressing since that day, and I'm 28 now. So seven years clean, seven years hiatus from ranch dressing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's, that's a very good place to start. Um, so like I mentioned, you know, we can, we can take this conversation so many ways, um, based off of just your background, your experience. Uh, one of the places that I think is a cool place to start because personally, I don't have experience through this. And I know a lot of our listeners, uh, may want to know more information. Um, you obviously did medical school in the Caribbean. So like walk me through that process. Like, what was your experience like? Uh, what did you think of it after finishing? Yeah, for sure. And I'm going to tell you, um, I'll start even from high school, just give people a little bit of my background and then go on to go into the Caribbean. And partly it's because I think I'm kind of atypical. You know, I am a first generation doctor and neither of my parents finished high school. And so I think that's, you know, kind of unique as well. And my parents didn't ever told me that I had to be a doctor or be some kind of prestigious, have a prestigious career. They told me whatever I loved, that's what I needed to do. Um, but from a very young age, seeing my parents struggle financially, struggle in their careers, and seeing their work ethic, I think, gave me the work ethic I have in all areas of my life. You know, I remember my mom going to work, you know, like at six in the morning and coming home at seven at night and would be black from head to toe from working at a scrapyard all day long, you know, and she did that to provide for us. And I think I took that work ethic from, that I saw that my parents had, and I applied that to every avenue of my life. And so I tell that just to tell any medical students or pre-med students that are out there, like, do not let your current situation or your family situation hold you back. Like you can literally achieve anything in this world that you want if you have the hard work and the work ethic to do so. And so regardless where you're at right now, if it's your dream to become a doctor, you can do it. Okay. And so with that, I worked my butt off. I graduated high school as valedictorian. 
Uh, then I went to college out in Salina, Kansas, small school, Kansas Wesleyan University, where I played football. I uh, graduated there in three years in a degree of biomedical chemistry. I graduated with like a 3.89 GPA, I believe, and took the MCAT. I did not study on for the MCAT. <laughs> uh, and so yeah, I know that's so dumb, right? And so like I didn't study because I'd always done well on exams. I always, you know, had a high GPA and I honestly was pretty ignorant. I was very naive and didn't know that it was not really a test based off of your science science knowledge, but you really need to study for this exam. And so I probably sure. made the lowest score in the history of the MCAT, you know, and, <laughs> and so with that being said, I decided to apply anyway. And right. I ended up, uh, it was like late November, December, I applied to St. George's University, which I didn't know anything about. Um, but my aunt, who's a doctor here in Arkansas, her boss is like a big time doctor. He told me I should definitely apply there, that I'd be dumb not to try it. Well, I applied in December, got accepted and left in January. And so then, uh, for those that don't know much about the Caribbean medical schools, um, you know, there is definitely a stigma about them. And partly that is because one getting into it's easier. And so you do not have to have a, as high of an MCAT score. You do not have to have as high of a GPA. And they take a lot more people. And so that alone makes people automatically, you know, think that it's like <clears throat> not nearly as good and things. And then also it's a lot harder to get a residency when you get out. And so people need to keep that in mind when they're applying to Caribbean medical schools and know that there could be some really big challenges that come ahead of time. Okay. And then, so my experience at a Caribbean medical school, I could only speak on St. George's university because that's where I went, but it was Awesome. I love every single second of it. It was the I was looking hardest. For, I was waiting for you to tell me that. <laughs> yeah. So it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Uh, I'll be completely honest, but it was also the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm a little biased because I met my beautiful wife there. Right. <laughs> uh, and so we love it and we fell in love there. And so we definitely have a lot of special memories. Uh, but so you do two years in the Caribbean and that's like all of your book work. And after that, you take step one. And if you pass step one, then you go on to clinical rotations. And if you go to St. George's, most of them will be on the East Coast. And so we were in New Jersey and New York for two years. And then we applied to residency and couples matched here at Arkansas. Wow. So uh, I, there's so many things about that that resonate similar to uh, my journey. In fact, I have my my parents both, you know, blue collar workers, barely saw them in the morning, barely saw them at night, but the hard work basically told you kind of what you could do. Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that, you know, your story about your mom totally hit home. Um, I'm actually surprised. So I don't know if this is something that's typical for Caribbean schools or if it's particular to St. George, but is, is it normal to do your rotations back in the States or do some institutions continue to do it in the Caribbean's? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. And again, I can only speak for St. George's and a couple others. You know, I think Ross and AUA, I think they do their rotations back in the United States as well. Um, again, I'm not 100% sure, but I think um, a lot of the big time, big time Caribbean medical schools would do their rotations back in the U.S. Interesting. That's something I didn't know. Um, so that's, that's good insight for me. Um, so what is, let's just say somebody is considering going to Caribbean school and they're, they're aware that, um, you know, it may be easier to get into, you're definitely gonna have to work your butt off, um, to get back into residency. Um, what kind of things do you, would you give to advice? You know, somebody that's already got into the Caribbean school or is doing, you know, their training there, um, yeah. to potentially get a good residency spot when they come back. Yeah. So it changes a little bit now that step one is pass fail, right? Sure. And so that definitely changes things. So one thing that they could do is study hard and make sure I have a high GPA. Now, I don't, I don't think that residency programs are still going to put a ton of weight on GPA, but now that step one is out of the picture, um, you need to make sure you have a good GPA and pass step one. And so first and foremost, pass step one and have a good GPA. I think those are huge things. Um, another thing is that in doing those two things, that's going to prepare them to do well on step two CK. And so right. I think step two CK now is going to be what residency programs like anchor everything on. This is what, well, agree. what yeah, that's what they're going to look at. Right. And so the hard thing is like, IMGs or Caribbean medical students used to have a second chance, right? Like they did okay on step one, but maybe didn't do their greatest. Well, now they have a second chance to crush step two CK. Well, that second chance is taken away now, right? right. So now you have to crush it on your first go. And so yeah. don't, don't fail step one. 
crushed up to CK and that alone, I think would get them a ton of residency interviews. Um, but then outside of that is when I was at St. George's, the opportunity for community service is huge. We were able to do so many things around the Island. Like we, um, there was a school that the restroom facilities were just destroyed. It looked terrible. Like I wouldn't let my dog go to the bathroom there, let alone any child go to the bathroom there. Jeez. And so we were fortunate enough to raise money. Um, a group of us raised, I think it was like 20,000 EC, which is equivalent to like 8,000 or $9,000 US within six days and refurnished their bathrooms, you know? And so awesome. doing, doing things like that. And we raised money to send children across the sea um, to Jamaica to get surgeries done that couldn't have them done in Grenada. And so doing things like that, that you're passionate about, that you love, that you can put on your resume, I think is also pretty big. Right. No, that's really helpful. I think, I think that that message kind of correlates with anybody, regardless if you're, you know, doing your training here, For sure. especially what's, what step one becoming pass fail. Uh, in my opinion, I don't know where you stand on this, but I do think having the emphasis on step two CK lines up with more of what you actually need to know as a doctor, you know, you, especially as a second year resident. Um, I don't know how much of your step one knowledge you remember, but mine is pretty close to zero at this point. Yeah. Uh, there we Nothing. go. <laughs> so just, just want our, 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 you know, our viewers to know that you don't really take that knowledge much, much further than, <laughs> Right. That's day. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's uh, that message of just focusing on really what matters, which is making sure you, you're doing well in your classes, you're, you're learning how to become a good physician. And ideally, that helps you on step two CK. But then obviously doing the humanistic parts of medicine that we're kind of, kind of built to do, right? You, you spoke, spoke about amazing community service projects, but people can do that in so many different avenues, whether that's helping one individual um, that's interested in medicine or, you know, that's uh, interested in public health to taking it in the form of, you know, international global global health, like you, you were speaking of. For sure. And you know, that's why we're doing what we're doing right now, right? Like the whole reason for this podcast is to help others, you know, like to encourage others. And I think that doing things like this, whether it be like raising money for those things that I talked about, doing these podcasts, talking to my people on TikTok over here, whatever it is, like the, this helps us and inspires us. Uh, and I think helps prevent burnout, you know? And so like, Absolutely. as we do these things and pour ourselves into these people, it, we're doing it, yes, out of selflessness to help them, but also out of selfishness, in which this gives us energy. This gives oh, us totally, fuel. totally. This gives us life, you know. And so, totally. yeah. I, I so I, I want to kind of go there because um, I think, like we we mentioned, like this is something that we have on the side. You know, we're both physicians. We can come home and we can do the typical work, long hours. Come home, you know, hang out with their significant other, uh, and go to sleep and repeat. Uh, and we probably see a lot of examples, you know, you at your residency program and definitely me at mine, where it feels like everyone's just physicians or a medical student for a majority of their lives, a majority of their day. Um, what have been some things that you have done to manage that balance? You know, we spoke about having something to give us energy, but what other things do you find keeps you going and avoids that burnout? Yeah, for sure. And so there's a couple of things that I do every single day, no matter what. Um, so first thing I usually wake up at 4 a.m. every single day um, and then I start my journaling and the first thing I keep in my mind is that being a doctor is part of my life it is not my life okay and so the, being a doctor does not define me okay it's just one little segment into my life and I have to make sure all these other areas that help define the whole part of who I am are included and so at 4 a.m. I, rem I remember I, uh, being a doctor is part of my life. It is not my life. And then with that, I write down, um, like three goals of mine that I have for that day. And then after that, I, uh, write down my why, like why it is that I am a doctor, why it is that I want to wake up and do this, why it is I want to go to the hospital and serve with all my heart. And then I Bible study, work out, get to the hospital. And so, um, and then before those things, I also make a daily plan to kind of fill in everything else. So in short, I would say things that I do to help me prevent burnout is remember that being a doctor is not my life. I remember my why every single day. I make sure to include my hobbies such as fitness, family, faith. Um, and then I rely, on, I rely on God a lot for strength to keep me going every day and then do things that give you stress relief and making sure to get adequate sleep. So it sounds like a lot. 
Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but if you make it like a detailed schedule and, um, I have a, I have my schedule is like what I call the unbreakable schedule. Um, if you do that and do it every single day and make sure you do things that de-stress you, I think burnout kind of burns out. I, uh, so you, you mentioned two phrases that I like one, the last one, burnout kind of burns out. I should be on a t-shirt for sure. Um, <laughs> But but definitely something that I really enjoy, which is, you know, a uh, doctor is a part of my life, but it's not my life, right? Like it's the idea that it's not about fitting yourself into medical school or you're fitting your life into medical school, but it's fitting medical school into your life. And as you kind of mentioned at the very end, like when people talk and they see examples of people they want to emulate, that they want to have like that stress relief kind of aurora around sometimes they see everything they do and they get overwhelmed that maybe it's not possible for them um, i enjoy your your concept of the unbreakable schedule um, i think one thing that I, I remember giving tips to especially as my my old former self when i was learning and realizing that i was getting not burnt out but realizing i wasn't able to enjoy everything the way i wanted to was simply giving myself something at the start of the day for me it was my workout just like you you know waking up at four or five and getting that fitness in and at the end of the day, like I hated, I don't know if it's true for you, but I hated that part of like studying and going straight to bed. Yeah. It made me feel like my day was like, it started with med school and ended with med school or started right. with residency and vice versa. So if, if you're struggling, you're listening to this and you see two people with examples that are clearly enjoying their lives while medicine is a part of it. Um, I'd recommend, you know, like Tommy mentioned, having some form of unbreakable priorities or schedule where you start and end with something that's you know special to you and then build from there yeah and then one thing I, that i should have touched on more because i kind of rambled there for a little bit is like there are some pillars that i would say that helps prevent burnout and one would be your health and so with that just eating eating a balanced diet making sure to get seven to nine hours of sleep at night and people laugh oh i'm a resident i can't do that yes you can and having that unbreakable schedule helps with that and then exercise daily so in the health pillar it's sleep exercise and good nutrition and then um i think for like your emotional pillar that is like for me that'd be my faith my relationship with my wife i um, my relationship with my friends and family and so making sure you include those in your day every single day and then the last one I think would be like kind of like a motivation pillar. And what is it that keeps you going every single day? And that's when I was talking about in the morning when I write down my why. When I write down my why, not only am I writing it down, but I'm reflecting on all these like uh, big magic moments that I've had with patients, right. right? Where like a patient told me that I made a difference in their life, where I went off of four hours of sleep, even though I shouldn't have been lacking that much sleep. <laughs> and I went to work anyway, and I did the right things for this patient, spent extra time praying with her or him, and they told me that I changed their life. When you hold on to that, that's when burnout burns out, right? That's when like y tiredness isn't a thing. That's where your motivation isn't lacking because you're remembering these things and it's going to get you jacked out of your face to go to work every single day. Totally. I, I think, I think we have the same concept. I call it my golden nugget where like every time you have one of those awesome patient experiences or mm -hmm. life experiences, you just, when you feel demotivated, you're like, well, what was the last time I felt amazing? Mm -hmm. And it was like the effort that I spent in that patient room or studying for that exam. You know, if you're a student, was it worth it to get the result that I did? And if you crush your, your, your test or you, you felt amazing about the patient interaction you had, then the answer is always yes. And so when you're feeling right. demotivated and you can walk into that patient's room or wake up in the morning saying, I'm going to try to make a difference. I may not do it to the level that I did on that golden nugget, but mm -hmm. maybe I can get one later this week. And that definitely keeps me driving forward. So I'm glad that we have that concept, you know, between us. Yeah, for sure. I agree completely. So uh, another element of your balance that we got to touch on because I am nowhere at the level that you are. And I want to know, you know, how, how you clearly got to this point or well, we got to talk about your fitness, man. Um, it's it's <laughs> cl clearly on another level. Like where is the background? Where did it get started? And then, you know, we'll, we'll touch on most importantly, how you're able to manage to incorporate that in a busy residency, medical school life. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, fitness, I would say it's always been part of my life. Um, not necessarily fitness, but uh, getting stronger, getting faster, getting bigger, 
um, because I started playing football at a young age, going into third grade is when I started and I started lifting weights going into the fifth grade. And so I started lifting weights and doing like athletic type things at a very young age. And it was just for a performance or to do good at football. Um, I ended up, uh, I was really overweight in elementary school and going into high school, I was sick of everyone making fun of me. So I decided to lose. I think you have a good picture on your Instagram page (laughs) showing that, right? (laughs) Yeah, I definitely do. Yeah. Um, so I was pretty, (laughs) I was pretty overweight and was sick of people making fun of me. So I lost tons of weight. Well, then I got made fun of for being too small and that I couldn't play football being that small. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to lift weights all the time, even more. And so I just fell in love with lifting. And then I ended up going to college football. And that's really where my passion for lifting and and uh, studying it and learning the knowledge behind building muscle and things of that happened in undergrad. And then it was like, I'm going to be as big as possible. I'm going to be as strong as possible. Uh, and so I was literally just lifting a ton, eating a ton. And so at that time, fitness, I wouldn't say was a priority, but uh, bodybuilding or weightlifting, that was a priority. Now I was eating absurd amount of food at that time and <laughs> weighed a ton. But then after college, I then found a passion for fitness. And what I mean by that is all encompassing, you know, like exercise, nutrition, the foods you eat, um, all of that sleep, uh, hygiene, everything. That's when I really fell in love with fitness. And, but at that time I still was not into any kind of cardiovascular activity whatsoever. Uh, if anybody asked me to run, I would ask them what's chasing us, you know, like, yeah, like I was not <laughs> for that at all. And then, um, I met my beautiful wife and I met her at 5 AM in the gym. And she says, I don't know if this is true, but she says that I said that if she were to lift with me, I would run with her. Now, I don't know if I buy that. I don't know if I ever would have said that I would ever run for any reason. Um, but I ran with her and we went on a 10 mile run. I had a stress fracture, couldn't walk for like a week. Um, it destroyed me. Great start to a relationship. (laughs) Yeah. Um, but that's kind of how I got into endurance sports. And then two years later I had ran nine marathons. I ran a marathon with a 20 pound vest, a 40 pound vest. Um, I qualified for the Boston marathon and I did all that while maintaining my muscle mass. And then here recently I decided during my intern year, I wanted to challenge myself and kind of show that you can maintain health and fitness during residency. And I thought the best way to do that would be to complete a full distance Ironman. And so I did that, uh, this past year during intern year. Congratulations. That's huge. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So that's kind of the whole journey. (laughs) That's, that's uh, absolutely insane. I'll, I'll give our listeners a second to like pause and just like let their mind be blown. Um, <laughs> because like, you know, I, I've always been somebody that like m- gives you the tips to do you a minimal amount of fitness to keep yourself energetic. And like you mentioned, have that energy and keep yourself healthy, right? Mm-hmm. You don't want to be a physician and not be able to take care of yourself, but you've clearly taken it to a different stratosphere <laughs> to challenge yourself. Um, so it's super motivational to see, you know, I, I definitely this year actually signed up for my first marathon. Um, nice. and the, unfortunately it got postponed because of our current COVID situation, right. but we will, we will run it. Um, but the, the story from that is interesting because I could get up and run a couple of miles, but it was never like something again, who was chasing me as a concept if mm-hmm. I was running. Um, yeah. I, re- I remember coming, my wife and I, we went to vacation after like, it was my first vacation in residency for two weeks. So we went to Denver, uh, we came back and we c- clearly didn't follow your diet tips. So we felt awful <laughs> when we came back. Um, uh, and so I woke up the next day when we got back home to Austin, which is where my family lives and just decided to run. I told myself, I'm going to run as far as I can one way. And then you have no choice, but you have to run back. Uh, and I ended up doing, I think it was like 12 miles. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> and so, you know, if, if you can get up and force yourself to run X amount of miles and you can do like the next challenge for some people that may be just doing a mile or a 5k, so I just signed up for a marathon, uh, but just like you, you know, you got to find time. Uh, you can yeah. find the time to do those long runs and training. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. I'll keep using you as a motivation to make sure that I don't miss out on those workouts. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And for the listeners, like know that you do not have to do this absurd amount of thing. Like you don't have to sure. run a marathon. You don't have to do an Ironman. Uh, you know, I do it for, you know, specific reasons. Um, but for you guys, 
you know, just doing exercise daily, you know, like the recommendation is like 150 minutes a week. Um, and the American Heart Association has researched to show that up to six hours or more has been proven to be beneficial without being harmful. And so you could definitely do a lot of cardiovascular activity and it'd be very beneficial. Um, but you don't have to. And so my advice in terms of fitness is one, do what you love Two, do it often. And that's it. You know, and so I think uh, if you could implement some co- sort of cardio and some sort of strength training, you'll be good to go. It would be cold. Then. No, that's, that's awesome, man. I'm, I'm glad that we can simplify it for the people who have no desire to get into the gym or put on <laughs> right. their running shoes. But there's also people that probably want to see, you know, examples of individuals, you more than I, of clearly going out there and putting in the work outside of the hospital uh, and yeah. bettering their life, which is awesome. Um, so I, I want to wrap up with one last thing. Um, you know, we've talked about balance and you mentioned some of your pillars, you're being one of them being that your, your family's a huge one. You know, you, we've talked about your wife a lot in this conversation, but I know you're expecting, um, to yes. have a new, a new baby boy join your life. So tell me about the inside of how that goes. Cause that's another wrinkle, right? Like, um, yeah. being, becoming a dad in medicine in residency, like what's been the challenges so far? How have you overcome it? And then. What kind of things are you planning on doing, you know, when the little one ends up coming to the world? Yeah, for sure. And so just in general, like to have a healthy relationship in residency can be very challenging. You know, my wife is a resident as well. And so both of us, our time is very precious and very um, contracted. There's not a lot of it. And so with that, we make sure that every single Friday, no matter what, we have a date night, that we have pizza somewhere where like all social media is away, all cell phones are away, that it's just the two of us every single Friday from the time we're off work till the time we go to bed. And that I, I would say is huge for us. Um, and then outside of that is every single night, every single um, day, we make sure to have time carved out for one another. And so for us, that's after we get home and our workouts are done, usually from about 8 p.m. till the time we go to bed. Um, it could be like seven if we get home earlier and have dinner together and stuff, but we make sure to have that time. And so having that special time together is very, very important for a healthy relationship. Uh, and then having a kid during residency, you, you know, it it's, comes with its challenges. Right now, we have not experienced too much of them. I haven't anyway, um, right. because she's <laughs> the one uh, carrying the baby and dealing with morning sickness. For her, the first 14 weeks were pretty brutal. Uh, she had morning sickness every single day. And just to kind of make a statement of how much of a rock star my wife is. Uh, Not only was she 12 weeks pregnant, uh, not only was she working full-time as a resident, um, working full-time as a wonderful wife, but she also trained and completed a half Ironman being 12 weeks pregnant. Yeah. So she is a rock star and she, she's just incredible. And so, um, you know, I'd say the biggest challenges were those first 20 weeks when she was really sick a lot of the time. Um, now we're about to experience challenges of having daycare. We don't have family nearby, um, that would be able to babysit and things. So trying to find daycare is definitely a challenge. Uh, right now we're on every waiting list possible and we're only on uh, spot number 50. And so <laughs> we'll have to see how that works out. Well, I mean, I have no doubt that just listening about you and your wife throughout this conversation that you guys are going to be amazing parents. Um, (laughs) Clearly, you will make your child another part of your pillars and you'll find time um, to fit them in. Yeah. So, uh, Tommy, uh, thank you so much. Um, This was an amazing conversation. Hopefully, the listeners can get that energy behind just like what you're saying, which is, you know, you are a doctor, but a doctor doesn't consume your entire life. Um, And you can totally burn out, burn out. Uh, you're a perfect example of this. Um, I, I want to always end these interviews with something um, special, which is we always give advice, um, and sometimes the advice is a little loose-ended. But I think the best advice that we can give other people is what advice we would, would we have given to our former self. So put yourself back in that shoes of that early medical student, you know, deer in the headlight and wanting to do this uh, and looking at yourself now, what's the biggest piece of advice you'd give yourself? Yeah, of course. I'd say that the biggest piece of advice that I'd give myself is to not give up and that at the end of the journey, the hands that you hold um, when one of your patients are going to lose one of their loved ones, and the conversations you have at bedside and the person's most desperate position they've ever been in and the most right. cherished moments of their life and the hardest moments of their life, um, the hugs that you have after you've made 
the diagnosis that no one else could make, the tears that you share when you have helped someone be cured of cancer, like all of those moments make all the struggles that you guys are currently go through so worth it. And so do not give up. Um, always look uh, towards the big goal and the light at the end of the tunnel because I promise you it's worth it. Uh, I can't add anything better, my friend. Um, so, Tommy, uh, where can our listeners learn more about you, find you? You know, this is your red carpet. Tell me tell me where they can learn more about you and where they should go. For sure. So you get a – I'd love to have you guys join my Instagram family or my TikTok family. And you can do that by just going to Dr. Tommy Martin. You can find both of my accounts there. And then on YouTube, if you just search Tommy Martin, I think you should be able to find my YouTube channel as well. So I'd love to have you guys join all my platforms and join the family. Well, we'll be sure to put your links in all the descriptions. Uh, but tell my listeners, um, you know, this is a perfect example of somebody we should try to emulate. Um, definitely a great physician just from that last segment um, and cares about his patients, but is able to balance. And that's the whole idea that both of us are trying to get across is that you can do this if you're early on. You know, don't feel like your background, like both of us, um, precedes you or prevents you from becoming a great physician or becoming a physician in the first place. But once you're down that line, you know, you don't have to be the burnt out, tired doctor that starts to enjoy their life at 32. Um, Tommy's a great example of how that's not true. Um, so definitely follow him on all his platforms. We'll link it down below. Tommy, my friend, it's been real. Um, thank you. Uh, for joining us and hopefully we can have you on a future episode uh, once we get a little bit further down on the TMJ show. Thanks man for so much for joining. Of course. Thank you for having me. All right, guys, hopefully you guys enjoyed this conversation, this interview that I had with Tommy. Again, amazing guy. Definitely check out all of his Instagram, his TikTok, um, and all of his other social media platforms down below. Um, and also wish him congratulations because since the recording of his video, um, him and his wife, Phoebe, have now um, said hello to their beautiful new son, Oliver, um, or Ollie. And so you guys can find pictures of him on Instagram. Um, Tommy, congratulations. Um, and again, if you are new to this channel, consider um, subscribing to this channel for more interviews, more videos just like this one. And if you're not familiar with Tommy, make sure you follow him on all of his social media handles as well. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thanks for being a part of my journey, part of Tommy's journey. Hopefully we've been a little help to you guys on yours. We'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.